Good morning. You can hear me, okay. Uh, good morning, I'm Kelly Welsh, a retired Surface Navy and Director of Business Development and Outreach at the United States Naval Institute. Um, welcome to the West Theater panel session, How Ukraine Has Changed the Game for Our National Security, Scaling Commercial Capabilities Across the DOD and Our Allies. I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator of the panel, Commander Mark Lennon. Commander Lennon is currently assigned to the Defense Innovation Unit in Silicon Valley, where he has served since 2019. In this role, he advocates for DIU's mission at the flag, SES, deputy, and undersecretary levels, advising some of the most senior federal government leadership on digital innovation. He has been instrumental in opening a direct line of collaboration between the Ukrainian government and DIU around digital innovation on the battlefield. He is also head of the global public sector at Apple Inc., where he leads the strategy and program development for a multi-billion dollar business segment for the company. His naval career, vast naval career, includes assignments as intelligent liaison officer to the Japan Maritime self Forces, as well as a lot of experience working with many SEAL teams uh, on the ground in Iraq and other places. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Commander Mark Lennon. Thank you. All right. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping here first. One, my voice carries. I'm aware of that. My ex-wife is aware of that, and I apologize. Uh, so if you haven't had coffee yet, I'll keep you awake. Um, so we're going to start um, by introducing the panel. I'll tee, tee things up. We'll have some, uh, uh, some discussion. And then we want to leave time for you to uh, ask questions, so if uh, you'll be brave enough at about 11.35 to come up to the mic, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I'd like to start uh, by saying thank you for coming. This is a, I think we've got a packed house here uh, at AFSIA. I've really enjoyed the ability to have this intersection of my civilian and Navy Reserve careers at DIU. It's been really special for me, particularly as I'm getting on in years, uh, you know, to be able to support DOD in a way that I know how, just intrinsically via my, uh, my civilian background has been wonderful. And I think DIU is a pretty special place to be, whether you're uniformed uh, or civilian. So let's start. We're going to introduce the panel. Uh, start with uh, with Chuck. Good morning, everyone. Oh, okay, yeah, that does. My voice does carry, I guess, a little bit. Uh, good morning, everybody. Chuck McGraw. I'm the vice president of s sales for Scadio. Uh, relevant to what brought me there, I spent 20 years in the U.S. Navy in the SEAL teams. I was fortunate enough to do 11 combat deployments, uh, both on the national and theater side. And what Scadio does, and relevant for this conversation today as well, is we produce software-defined Group One Blue UAS NDA compliant drones. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Rita Konaev. I'm the Deputy Director of Analysis and a Research Fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, which is a think tank linked to Georgetown University. There, I primarily work on military applications of artificial intelligence and Russian military innovation and Russian military technology. Morning, everyone. My name is Akil Iyer. I'm at a venture capital firm named Shield Capital. We're a new fund that's focused on the nexus of commercial technology and national security. I cover down on investments across cybersecurity, space, autonomy, and AI. And I'm coming from a background in the Marine Corps and and a stint at Anduril. Fantastic. All right, to kick things off. So we're at about a year here, uh, almost, I think on February 20th uh, of the war in Ukraine. And, and I think probably everybody in this room um, is surprised by that, uh, at the scrappiness, the grit, and the innovation of the Ukrainian people uh, as, they fight, as they fight the Russians uh, from their soil. But I think what's worth knowing is, yes, Part of what Ukraine has done in that scrappiness, grit, and particularly on the innovation side was very much out of necessity, but that just didn't happen overnight. I, I was very lucky to, uh, to have met President Zelensky now twice, uh, the last time in Ukraine a month before the war, and you know what he said is, is Mark, we, we've been investing and in making digitization of our country 
a top like pillar level priority of his presidency since he became president. Uh, and that manifests itself in setting up the Ministry of uh, Digital Transformation to really focus on digitizing the country and innovating as a practice. And he said, it's not just a matter of national pride and a pillar of our economy, but it's, it is a, uh, central to our national security. And so this is something that Ukraine has been thinking about and uh, kind of developed the, the institution to do it and the muscle memory. And, and now here we are in the middle of a war and they've really demonstrated the ability to field uh, commercial technology in very innovative ways to uh, to support the war effort and I, I think anybody who reads the paper or watches the news you see evidence of that uh, almost every day uh, whether it's developing things like the Delta app which was their spatial awareness kind of like an uh, ITAC ATAC app if you're familiar with that um, moving uh, uh, predominantly uh, all their government services to the cloud uh, what they call an army of drones. They've been, they've been adapting and fielding this very quickly. So we're gonna talk about this today. DIU, our mission is to uh, accelerate commercial technology into DOD. And so what can we learn from Ukraine? What are the challenges posed by DOD being the largest bureaucracy in the world? Um, and, but how could DOD change? And so we're gonna start off a uh, question what are the lessons that are emerging from Ukraine uh, based on you know, how they're using commercial tech and what we're seeing, uh, and, and how are they prosecuting a war using tools that you know, a lot of us have available to us every day? Uh, I'm gonna start by posing that to you, Rita, and then the rest of the panel, please feel free to, uh, to jump in. Thank you, Mark. I'll start by making three comments on these lessons that we are learning that will hopefully tee up the conversation. Obviously, there are a lot of lessons that we are learning, but it's also worth remembering that we are a year in in what is shaping up to be a war of attrition. So we should be very uh, attentive and cognizant that this is a midpoint and perhaps even the start of what is likely to be a long war. So what are the lessons that we are learning? First of all, command and control structure matters fundamentally to the ability to integrate commercial technologies and to use them at speed. You see that differentiation really clearly between the command and control structure of the Ukrainians that has been flexible, agile, very decentralized without becoming too chaotic and still allowing for sharing of information to in contrast to Russians, which is very uh, solid, structural, and in some ways also decentralized because there is no effective sharing of information. There's a lot of silos. So that flexibility, that decentralization without chaos has allowed the Ukrainians to really connect with companies and to leverage the technology that they've been you know, sourcing quite effectively on the ground. That is right now, from an operational and tactical perspective, has been a blessing. How this is going to translate in a longer later term to the ability to scale those capabilities across a much broader defense organization is an open question. The second point is one about diplomacy and narrative. I think one of the most incredible things that the Ukrainians has accomplished is that they got much of the world to their side and they've done so by promulgating a narrative that is just and that is winning a country that is fighting a just war and a country that is winning it. In that way, they're not only correct in what they're doing and defending themselves, but they justify the, inv the investment in them. Nobody wants to back a loser. Nobody wants to spend money on a lost cause. And that ability to cultivate that narrative of a just war that is being fought and won, that messaging, that you know, an inf information operation dimension to it. The ability to communicate that to companies really has been attractive to the commercial industry because they don't need to feel bad about themselves that they're getting involved in the business of war and they don't need to be feel bad that they're wasting money on a lost cause. So just and winning. And finally, I think it's really useful for us to keep in mind that the ability to use technology which the Ukrainians have been doing really impressively, 
does not necessarily mean large-scale effectiveness and does not necessarily mean the ability to scale that technology. We get, at least in the public space, which in the public information space, I don't have access to classified material, so there are people in this room that know way more than me, for sure. Uh, at least from what we're seeing in the public space, there are a great deal of examples. But we don't know whether these examples develop into a concrete pattern of effectiveness. If anything, some research that has looked into this shows that, for instance, 90% of the drones that have been deployed over the first six months of the war have been destroyed. And only about 30% of them have been able to meet their goals. So use does not necessarily mean effectiveness. And still, none of that really promises us the ability to scale those capabilities that they've learned in the war. They've been really great at the operational and tactical level. We don't know what happens when the bureaucracy gets involved. Right now, the bureaucracy has kind of been stalled and put on ice. But we know that when we're talking about longer term transformation, whether it's digital transformation, procurement transformation, military modernization, bureaucracy comes into play. And there, there's a conversation to be had about whether decentralization is useful and helpful for scaling, and how do you avoid not being able to share that information that you need across the organization more broadly. Thank you. You know, um, Chuck, I'd be interested to uh, get your take on this, right? Uh, you've both been a warfighter uh, and now working for Skydio, you know, a company that isn't huge, but has been directly interfacing with Ukraine. You know, what what is your take uh, on what they're doing, how they're doing, based on your kind of experience from industry? Yeah, that's a great question. And as I think about this as a warfighter, every individual here knows the number one weapon on the battlefield is your radio. I learned that as a young SEAL that it wasn't your gun, it wasn't grenade, it's your radio. And what's the second one? The eyes in the sky. Many times, if, you're, if you can't get comms when you're going out the gate, you're not going on the mission. If that drone can't fly or you can't have a manned asset in the sky, you're not going on the mission. That's something we know. When you think about command and control, this is where Skydio comes into play, where working with the Ukrainians, understanding that need, that C2 is one of the most important things and sometimes one of the most challenging things for them to deal with, they have to have an asset that is organic to the unit. They can't rely on conventional fixed wing platforms that easily, as we all are learning, in a near peer threat environment are not effective. So when I think about that, we, it, the first thing we had to do is we had to make a decision as a company. Our product can help the Ukrainian people. We could not stay neutral. We had to make a decision. We decided, of course, to go on the, the right side of the, uh, the equation. A lot of us at the company still remember Wolverine being yelled as, uh, <laughs> as uh, the Red Dawn movies we watched as kids growing up. And we decided to get in, get engaged, get systems in country as soon as we could. In May, we did our first trip over where we got systems to the front line. And since then, we've set up a Ford, Ford Logistics, re reverse logistics in support of the Ukrainian people because that is a capability as a private company and as experienced warfighters, we could do. The other aspect of it is, as we're deploying systems, if they're having an, only a 10% effective rate, then how do we adapt our technology to meet the battlefield requirements? Where's the, the mission need statements? Where, where's the, the gap in the capability? So we realized very quickly, we had the four logistics set up. We had the reverse logistics set up. Because we're a Silicon Valley company, we believe in customer-centric design, so we already had systems in place inside the company by which, which we took customer feedback, adapted it, worked with the solution engineers, communicated a product, and adapted. Something that sometimes you see as a challenge with our own procurement process, we capitalized with the Ukrainian uh, people. We took their feedback, we came back to uh, San Mateo, we developed new capabilities. Well, one of the issues with was some of the RF propagation. We went back, tuned our system, which is a software-defined system, updated the software package, released it to the edge with disconnected systems, but because we had that infrastructure set up, that was key. So optimizing the feedback loop was, was imperative. 
And the last thing, you know, we talked about, you, you have to pick a, a, a um, you know, the decision has to be about what is just and right. And the other aspect of having the platform flying, collecting the data, there's currently 70,000 cases of war atrocities that the prosecutor general of Ukraine is trying to work through to hold the Russians accountable and do their everyday job conducting business, still thriving. And that was one of the most impressive things that I saw when I was in Ukraine is the buildings weren't demolished, they were rebuilding the buildings. The roads are being repaired literally weeks after the Russians tried to make a statement. I think the Ukrainian people made a much greater statement that we will not take a knee, we will not stand for this. So I was in DC last week listening to the prosecutor general for Ukraine and one of the statements he made is that um, you can't have justice without accountability and without justice we cannot have peace. And that was something I took away from like how do we get to play into that and how do we help do that, help them through that process. Thanks Chuck. All right, Akil, I got, I got a question for you. Um, you work with lots of companies on the venture capital side. These are uh, smaller companies, uh, probably aspire to be big. Um, many of them may not think about working in the DOD space because they view it as big and bureaucratic and slow. You know, has anything, whether it's the, the, the war in Ukraine and their very visible use of, uh, of commercial technology or just other factors that, that are leading kind of Silicon Valley companies and other tech companies, because they don't have to be uh, in Silicon Valley, um, you know, are, are, is, is there some factors that are leading to those tech companies, particularly some of the, that are smaller ones, non-traditional ones, that, that look at defense and national security as a legitimate, you know, area where they can provide support. Yeah, ab absolutely, Mark. I, I think the short answer is Ukraine is definitely an inflection point uh, for the engagement of commercial technologies within the national security domain. I think it's not just Ukraine. Um, you know, I, I think back to, you know, for folks who probably remember the Project Maven days of um, what was, frankly, actually a very, very small minority of employees who had some issues with that. that those days are far, far, far behind us. And I, I think, Mark, it's not just because of Ukraine. Um, a 30% reduction in the tech market value within the public sector um, also does that. The, the tailwinds to work with government, I think, are, are, are only rising because of the tech challenges that your primary industries face. And the government generally, once you are able to get on a contract, pays its bills on time, has pretty low churn. Um, and these are things that, particularly when the opportunities in the commercial space aren't there, um, you know, uh, companies, particularly early stage companies that are looking for new opportunities that may not have the, the ability to sell into an enterprise company because they're downsizing at, at this current moment. I think the one thing I'll add, Mark, to, to your first question too, a lot of these companies aren't your, you know, the ones that I could probably regurgitate in from, from The Economist, your sexy synthetic aperture radar companies that are doing pretty cool commercial uh, intelligence and, and information for Ukraine and Indopaycom partners. It's not Starlink, it's not natural language processing companies. It's actually the really unsexy ones like, Mark, you mentioned in the very beginning of your remarks, it's how do you move the Ukrainian government's, the government onto a digital platform? AWS helped with this, moving 10 petabytes worth of data so that the government could still function through a year of war, do all the things we expect the government to do. And I think that it, it's an important thing to, to keep in mind. A lot of these businesses that commercial enterprises are looking at are super un, unsexy. It's data integration, it's additive manufacturing and 3D printing, which I, think, I, which I think has not gotten a lot of attention, but is critical to some of the problems you mentioned, Rita, on how do you maintain near edge logistics and near, near edge capabilities that frankly will only happen in the exigencies of war because the regulation and certification requirements for those types of technologies ju just are slow and that changes when you're in wartime. Okay, so, but since, uh, since you have the mic and you're on it is, you know, what, what, can, what could DOD do to you know, more quickly uh, adapt commercial technology? Just often both wearing my civilian and my, uh, my Navy hat, very frequently, like uh, government, DOD being a government department, 
not familiar with like the art of the possible and what's already easily available out there. Um, you know, how, how do you, how do you one, start to kind of get DOD to understand that there's proven dual use commercial technology out there that's not scary, it's proven, um, and that you can rapidly field that to support the mission. Um, you know, how, how do you build that awareness? But then what would, what do you think if you were uh, in the upper echelons of the Pentagon for a day, what needs to change within DOD, whether it's, you know, policy, whether it's mindset, in order to be able to kind of more quickly adapt that technology. Yeah, thanks, th th thanks Mark. I think the simple answer is use what already has worked well. Um, from a venture standpoint, you know, stepping out of my previous experiences, you know, venture is just looking and investors are looking for signals of recurring revenue. So how do we get to that, that fastest? And the good thing is there's been some amazing innovation and in leveraging not new capabilities, but e existing ones. Chuck, I, I think of the middle tier acquisition for, for Skydio. Huge op opportunity, you know, General Smith talked about getting things done faster this morning, and I think that's exactly what that allows. I, I think to DIU, the model worked. Se Secretary Carter stood it up for a reason, uh, and now it's just an opportunity to scale what has been very, very successful. I think the last point I'll add in, Mark, and curious, you know, Chuck, Chuck on your thoughts too, is it's not just a DOD problem. Um, I think it's also an export problem, um, right? We're trying to, the commercial in, uh, industry, particularly startups, are looking for those opportunities to engage with our European and Asian Pacific partners and allies. Um, and it's always challenging working through things like ex export control reform. Um, but I think those are important things because th those are the capabilities. We can't give a lot of our government exquisite capabilities to European or a Asian allies, but we can give commercial capabilities. How do we increase the pace and velocity of that right. ability to do so, I think is critical too. Now, you, you, that's a great point, right? Is there's some core, you know, technology built by many of the, the people on this floor that's, you know, core national security program of record weapon systems, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about commercial technology that, you know, is probably already in use in the commercial sector, maybe used in uh, somewhere in the in the government sector, but has not been like fully adapted for the Department of Defense. Is that kind of what you're? That's right, Mark. Yeah. And, and, and the example I'll give, I, I brought up synthetic ap aperture radar, which I think is a great one. It's a commercial capability that actually the Department of Commerce and NOAA gave a license to companies like ISI to provide a synthetic aperture radar capability that wasn't exquisite to the US government. What does that do for us? Well, that just means we're, we are an incredible, commercial technology is being the force multiplier for the multi-domain awareness for not just Ukraine, but hopefully our Asian Pacific allies. That's where I hope we, we get with that. And I, I think there's work already being done. It's challenging because on the other end, we want to protect our intellectual property, right? All the reasons why we had modernization with our Committee on Foreign Investment Review and Export Control. But there's a balance to play between protecting our national security and ensuring our partners and allies can take advantage of, of our commercial entities. All right, so here's, here's kind of the big, and I'm gonna pose this generally to the panel and whoever wants to jump in first can jump in. But here's kind of the big hairy question I think a lot of us think about is seeing the world, government, private sector rally to support Ukraine, um, I think has been, has been heartening. Is it a one-off uh, in that if a similar uh, you know, conflagration arises over Taiwan with China, do you see big tech companies, do you see you know, smaller tech companies, do you see you know, governments rallying at the same kind of level and providing the same level of support to a Taiwan uh, in a potential conflict with China, or does the calculus of these companies completely change? I can jump in with the aspect because we're assessing that now. We're looking at what's going on in the near peer threat environment. I mean, everybody is watching Ukraine to include China, to include Taiwan, to include Japan. I mean, you, you hit the list, everybody is watching that. And you know, we talked about what can DOD learn. Well, first off, let me tell you what DOD is doing right. They're asking questions. We do our IPTs with the Army every month. We share all of our lessons learned and lessons learned from the field. We explain to them the software updates that we're doing. Then we work on getting those software updates ATO'd and through the process to get them to the soldiers in the field, working with PMA 263 in support of the Navy and the Marine Corps to also do that, and also working with SOCOM to hit each one of the different component commands. 
know, they are doing that right. As we look at what is in the future and will we jump in, you can't stand on the side. If there's an, an, an issue in Taiwan, what is it, 80% of our semiconductors are produced in Taiwan, we cannot like, let Taiwan fall. Absolutely not. We're already seeing what can happen when you think of upstream defeat of our key components in our systems, not necessarily because the threat of Taiwan, but look at what is happening to Russia. Look at their, in a sense, their force readiness as we, the world, start to put pressure on them. This is not a Ukrainian fight. This is a global fight that everybody is watching. Traditional wars are not going to be fought the same way. You know, the, the new domain with cyber and space comes into play that we're still new. We're in our infancy. And how does that play into everything? I guess balloons are a part of that. I, I never would have thought when I started my career to think about balloons as a uh, potential ISR platform or SIGINT platform. But there's a lot of things in play. We have to open up our eyes and ears and embrace it. A quick message for other tech companies, the FAR is not going away. I'll say it again for other tech, and I hear some laughter, the FAR is not going away. Embrace it, understand how to work within it, structure your company in a way that by taking on those projects, you show a level of stability and maturity, and that is something we've done is help support, and that's what I see other people within our industry do. The bottleneck for us, I would say it's just continuous ATO, those challenges. So as we look at those next frontiers or those next fights or how we're gonna work by, with, and through, devise an assistant company, utilization of proxies, we have to be able to get the proper technology to the edge as fast as we can. And as we update it, we cannot let the bureaucracy of software ATO be a challenge. I'll just say a few quick things. Um, I think what's really going to matter in a Taiwan contingency is the clarity of the narrative. And we can talk about whether you can get commercial first companies on board, smaller companies, companies that don't necessarily work on DOD problem sets. And one of the main reasons, like I mentioned, that Ukraine has been getting them on board is the clarity of the narrative. It's a very simple right versus wrong fight. 80% of our semiconductors are being made in Taiwan is not a right versus wrong. It is more akin to, and I don't believe in this, I'm, but I'm going to say it nonetheless because I think from a public affairs perspective it matters, defend Taiwan for semiconductors sounds a whole lot like war for oil. And huge chunks of the population in the commercial sectors are gonna get triggered by that, and they're not going to like it as much as defend Ukraine because they're fighting big, bad Russia and winning. On the winning point, I think it really matters what the Taiwanese are going to do. What are they going to show to the world? What do they want and what are they capable of? We can talk about supplying them and arming them and giving them as much as commercial and exquisite capabilities as we can afford, which, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. But if this is a lost cause, and th if this is a nation for one decision or another is not necessarily ready or capable to put up the same type of a resistance that we're seeing from Ukraine, the clarity of the narrative will not be there. The type of a support Ukraine receiving will not be there, especially because the barriers are much more significant from a financial perspective. Losing Russia as your customer is not the same as losing China as your customer. So I think we have to be really clear-eyed about it, and I understand the temptation and the incentive and the true belief that we will be there for our allies and partners who need us during horrible times. But we also need to be quite clear about the things that matter under these circumstances. All right, Akil, let's go for the trifecta here. Weigh in on it. Yeah, it, it reminds me, Reed, I, I think you already provided the, the cynical look of it. For those in the audience, um, I think most have probably read Ghost Fleet um, by August Cole and Peter Singer. And there's a very interesting vignette, if you all remember in it, um, in a Walmart boardroom. And the scene is basically, there is a question about whether as a multinational company in the future setting of we're fighting the, the PRC, they've occupied Hawaii, and these multinational companies are trying to decide whether they pick a side or not and leverage the might of their 
logistical supply chain transportation network. Um, and what I find that scene so fascinating, it's a very small part of the book, but I find it so fascinating because it hits on this exact question of, it's not just a question of the American public, it's multinational companies that may, um, I think in the case of the book, luckily it all turns out well, you know, American flag companies um, help, help out. I think the very fact that that's in that book reflects the fact that it is uncertain whether a lot of these companies, particularly big ones, will be able to leverage the entire might of their organization in, in, order, in, in, in order to help us. And Rita, I, your, your points about what's Intel's, Intel had $20 billion worth of revenue comes from the, the PRC. Um, you look at even TSMC, the amount of uh, semiconductors they provide to mainland China. And I, I, I think the challenge here is whether we can do this if you believe Representative Gallagher and, and, and the China Commission, are we in a position in three years to be able to deter by denial or deter by cost in position these? And, and, and the concern is we may not be. Um, I, what I will maybe end on is some optimistic notes. Um, and, and, and that is, I mean, you see TSMC engaging directly with the United States. You see them working on projects uh, so that we have some supply chain resiliency. I think Taiwan's also learning these lessons. I mean, so Chuck, to your point, PRC absolutely is too. But the entirety of the Southeast a Asian nations are, are as well. Um, so I'll always go back to the allied point I, I made with commercial technology. I mean, would the quad and quadrilateral security dialogue and AUKUS be where it is today without Ukraine? I would, I would argue that the pace, the pace of that relationship would not be where it is today um, if those countries did not feel somewhat threatened or at least tangentially threatened. You know, one other point, and I, I, I love the fact that you say, you know, the, the war for, for uh, you know, microprocessors, for chips, that is not an effective way to look at this. We cannot, I mean, we can put boots on the ground in Ukraine, we, or we could, we could put boots on the ground in Taiwan and fight the fight. I believe everybody in this room who spent time with boots on the ground in Iraq, boots on the ground in Afghanistan or other areas, we learned a couple lessons. And it's something fundamentally we know as war fighters, soldier, sailor, air, airman, marine, and sp space cadets, I think that's what, I think so, right? Yeah. Guardians. 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 Um, that's, I think that was a movie, right? Okay. Either way, uh, what is imperative? First, you have to resource our partners. Then we have to enable them to build competence. And through that, and being standing next to them as tech companies or, or as the government, they build confidence. Because what did we see fail in Iraq? What did we see, f see fail in Afghanistan? They, poor resourcing at times, lack of training and enablement. They didn't have the confidence they could stand on their own. And would you stand and fight if you did not have those things? We demand that of our own people and our own systems and our own processes. How can we expect another country to stand up against an aggressor without that? So if you ask what can tech companies do, what can DOD do, resource, build competence, which will in turn build the confidence and then support them. Okay, uh, this will probably be um, the last question and again, posing it generally to the panel. I, I look out in the audience and there are a lot of people from industry, probably some smaller companies all the way up to larger ones. I also see uh, uniform personnel probably in a position to uh, either manage or influence acquisitions for their particular organization or command. So it's a two-part question is, what advice do you give some of these upstart companies? You know, they're innovative, they know they have you know, software, hardware uh, that can support the mission. Um, you know, what advice would you give them? Because they're not going to be able to, you, you mentioned the, the FAR is not going away. They're not going to be able to go through the long, you know, 15 month procurement. They just don't have the resources uh, to be able to do that. Um, so what advice would you give these companies that it would be new to DOD, but nevertheless have uh, something that, you know, they could really offer? in terms of improving our military capabilities. And then what advice would you give to some of the folks, folks out here who work from within DOD every day about you know, how to uh, think about commercial technology and maybe think about changes that could be made uh, to acquire it? Open-ended question for whoever wants to jump on that one first. I can give a, a, a quick shot. Um, 
think, I think the first mark is maybe just find a good advocate. Um, I think maybe that's both, both sides of the question. The example I'll bring up is, you know, Anderol's first real contract, right? Their program of record was not with the DOD, it was with the CPB, it was the Customs and Border, right? Um, and that happened, I think, in large part because they found the right need at the right time and a champion within the organization to be able to run with it. And they were able to get a program of record in a pretty short period of time, which I think is a good model. I, I feel, at least working with the portfolio companies that we have, you know, a lot of them don't come from the, nat the, the national security space, which is awesome. You know, two Apple engineers who are phenomenal at machine learning and don't know the logos on the Department of Defense website. That's actually great. That, to me, that, that's actually a great signal that we have young entrepreneurs individuals that would rather spend time working on mission problems and not another filter for Snapchat. Like that, that to me is winning in some sense. But navigating that, I think, is just a lot of time wasted. So I, I think the first part, and, I, and luckily there's folks like DIU, there's you know, a ton of different innovation organizations now, now to pick one, finding the right ad advocate there. I, I think from a, Mark, the flip side of it is, you know, and, and the statistic I'll, I'll bring in, I think, AFWorks transition rates from phase two to phase three zippers, like that, that traditional production to prototype is about 8%. How do we increase and accelerate that percentage? Because that's a signal to the companies for their interest in engaging because they want recurring revenue and a signal to the rest of the financial capital markets where we hope they want to add that cap, right? 10X the capital that the US government is, is putting in. Those signals are really important. I will just say, I think one of the concerns within DOD when looking at the commercial space has to do with reliability and whether those technologies can face tough environments and tough problem sets for good reasons, right? So the ability to demonstrate that, to show that you've tested in as close to an operational environment as possible if it's relevant and the test hard, learn the lessons, take that input, what you said yesterday, um, earlier on about the feedback loop, demonstrate that you've done that over and over again and communicate that to your advocate from the inside. So three things. The, the first message is not to the tech companies or to DOD, the first message is to the VCs. When you're providing funding for a company that is gonna develop dual use technology and they have a main focus on securing US government contract to show a level of maturity, security, and scalability, understand that's gonna take time, first off, when you're looking at your, the, the financial models. Understand there's a significant amount of IRAD or inter internal research and development costs that go into that. Be patient, help support. When you look at the amount of funding that it takes to secure one, one dollar from the US government, it's significant. So understand that, learn that, be sympathetic, be empathetic, learn that process, learn the government side. The second point is to the tech companies, use the innovation networks, use DIU. DIU has been a huge proponent of ours. I think we've only used one SIBR through uh, AFWorks. Great, great opportunity, very, very streamlined, quite, quite smart about how they approached it. But our biggest advocate is DIU. That, that is what they are there for. We bring customers, if we're working with a customer within DOD and they're, they're like, how do we procure this? How do, we, we pretty much hand off emails to DIU, say, I don't know. Well, we do know, but it's not our place to tell you, work with DIU. Put your pride aside, work with DIU. The other part, there's a talent war going on and everybody talks about it's talent war for engineers and smart this. I tell you what, there's a talent war for people that can take your product to market. Some of the best people to, to build a go-to-market team, a sales team, a marketing team, a customer success team are sitting in this room right now in uniform that soon will be transitioning or already have transitioned. Because guess what? I lit, before I got to Scottio, I've not sold a single thing. In three years, we turned it into a multi-billion dollar company with the majority of the business being a non-traditional defense company. It's not because I was some great sales team or the team are great at sales, it's because we are operators first. Yes, we wear Scadio shirts, but we bleed red, white, and blue. We understand the customer, we understand the need, and we have passion when we're working internally the company. The talent world, you have talent out there, go out, seize it. We understand the FAR, we understand OTAs, we understand MTAs. 
Give us the acronyms. I've been told many times in, in cross-functional meetings that uh, they need a, a, uh, you know, a translation guide. I said, well, you know what? When I come into a finance meeting, you're saying ARR and you know, customer, the CAC. I was like, I need a translation guide too, but I embrace it and I learn it. So industry, embrace it. Learn the business you're working in. And the last one for, for DOD, understand tech companies. They have to spend a significant amount of money IRAD to produce a product for you in a significantly constrained timeline that they're getting funding from these VCs. Realize you have to take that, and if we're doing these MTAs with these small tranches in the basis of issue, and then we have to amortize that IRAD, plus the cost of building the system and put a, put a margin on it, it's not going to be completely cheap, but there is no option unless you want to source stuff from another country that has the supply chain locked down, that has the human capital that locked down. But we can't. So understand that as well. So those are the three points for three different audiences, so. No, I, I appreciate uh, the plug for DIU, of course. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll finish this out just by providing a perspective on this, because I've, I've worked in and around government my, my entire career and advised a number of them, and not just you know, DOD, at, at every level. And there are certain things where, yeah, you, you gotta go through that traditional long-term procurement process um, where you're buying kind of core, big mission systems. But then there's just commercial technology. Uh, you, you're not gonna go through a big, long procurement to, uh, you know, to develop an app or to buy drones. That's just core technology, right? Core technology is evolving. And, and then, you know, working with DIU, you get the benefit of going through that prototype. Government is littered with failures uh, when it comes to adapting tech. Why is that? Because you, you, you end up going into this kind of isolated procurement process where you develop requirements in a vacuum, you don't talk to the commercial sector, then you come up with an Excel spreadsheet that starts with uh, things that say, like, the system shall. And then you say, okay, there you go, vendor community, respond. And the vendor community looks at that and goes, ah, shit. Well, I think we can respond to some of that. And then the other stuff that we're not sure about will be vague enough where they won't disqualify us. And then you end up getting, working with, you know, uh, a company that may not have, all, you know, meet your requirements because you didn't clearly articulate them and then they didn't really understand them. Whereas if you get in a prototype project, shoulder to shoulder, we're working together. We're defining those requirements. I'm understanding you, you're understanding us. The success, the, the, the likelihood of success at the end of a prototype project with much uh, less invested risk in terms of money, uh, you know, it, it's, it's substantially less than going through that big procurement process. You get a year into a project and go, yeah, this isn't working out. We're going to have to start over. And so I think, it, you know, my advice is to look at that and understand, you know, what are the things that are just kind of core technology that exist out there in the world that you should just be able to go buy and adapt via prototype? And then what are some of those things that are, yeah, those are no kidding, like core mission system things that we want to go through a very longer term kind of prescribed acquisition? Um, and so with that little soliloquy, I will now turn it over to you, the audience. Uh, would love to hear from you, whether you agree, disagree uh, vehemently with anything that was said, or just want to pose a question um, to our crack panel. I see people walking away. That's actually the opposite of what I wanted you to do. <laughs> this way. Good morning. On? Yep. Uh, actually, two different questions, uh, so I'll pose the easier one first. Um, as this is, is that better? Yep. Uh, as this is evolving and more uh, assistance aid and things brought to bear in the Ukraine, what is, from DIU's perspective and from industry and, and what you're seeing as far as, as you know, an, an, an analyst, how do we avoid, quote, showing our hand as far as some of our capabilities and so forth? in that theater that we would, what, what, what's the cutoff? What's the discussions that you have with DOD and so forth to say, hey, this is a commercially available technology, but let's step back for a minute because we may not want to 
You want to start with one? Yeah, I can start with that. So the question was, um, as we progress and we continue to push different capabilities into Ukraine, how do we not overplay our hand? How do we not expose some sensitive capabilities? I would ask, how can we not? If it means winning the war by exposing a capability, well, guess what? It's time to innovate that capability because you're only getting one chance to do it. We talk about a lot in cyber, exposing different cyber, cyber vulnerabilities or cyber offensive operations. Well, if, it, if it's a matter of winning a war and we have to expose that capability to do that and then we have to innovate on that cap capability and get that much further ahead, as opposed to like just holding it close and, oh, we know we're gonna use it one day. That one, guess what, the, the enemy is already evolving. They probably already know you have that capability. I just see the, um, the, the conflict that's going on right now as, um, well, quite frankly, baiting much of NATO into showing their hand and China's taking mm -hmm. notes. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the reason that I was curious, um, you know, what, what kind of fire breaks are, are you seeing? Hey, we would rather you not share this technology <laughs> From, uh, from your from an industry perspective so from an industry perspective that's right i mean you could take our drone you could reverse engineer it and it will take you about 12 to 18 months to understand what we do how we do it and where our secret sauce is yeah and, and we know that we understand that but anybody can do that they, it's a commercial off the shelf yeah. item they can take it it's, but even the same way with some of the other capabilities they can do that as well through proxies through um foreign intel i mean probably are doing it already. So that being said, what we do as industry is we innovate, we don't rest on our laurels, and that's the way we stay competitive against everybody else that's in the Blue UAS program, the other drone companies. We don't look at them, we look at what's on the horizon, and we work towards that. We try to stay ahead of our competitors to get ahead of the enemy by innovating. We have to innovate, we have to innovate, and that's the key thing as industry, to stay ahead of our competitors just for the success of the company and what sure. we believe in in our culture, but also for our customers, and that's the soldiers on the battlefield. Everything that we are exposing in Ukraine, we are taking that, refining it, and then we are pushing pushing it over to the Army, we're pushing it to the Marines, so it is feeding back into the DOD system. Thank you. And yeah. the, the second question that I had was, um, Commander, when you teed this up initially, you were talking about some of the innovation that was um, by Ukraine and how they are developing and, and shifting gears to, uh, to be more efficient and effective, and this kind of shifts over to uh, Dr. Konaev? Konaev. Konaev. I have my apologies. It's okay. But, um, it, I'm just curious with uh, the narrative. You were talking about the narrative that's out there right now and how that's being very effective in, in mobilizing assets and resources. My question is, from a research or from an analytical perspective, how much of that narrative is being driven by billions of dollars being made available to the investment side, being fed to the military-industrial complex and those that are feeding off of it? That narrative being shaped and driven by the investor the industri industry side to continue the funding coming from the government to to move that forward and I, I asked that specifically because you said as far as industry is innovating and so forth but how much is this a demand signal from Ukraine or science projects by industry saying hey look at the art of possible and this is what we need to do instead of what the demand signal is from Ukraine yeah That's so I, I can question, I so. can comment on that via my direct interface with Ukraine this is, is it's certainly not a question of tech companies go into Ukraine because they know that there's like US funding and say, boy, do I have the tool for you. <laughs> yeah. Such a deal. Um, it is very much, and, and to, to Ukraine's credit, it is very much problem focused, right? Like we need to, uh, to have the ability to have, you know, eyes on target to direct fires for, you know, we need to increase that by X. Um, and then those problems, you know, come back and they get curated and, you know, there's certain companies that have the ability to kind of engage uh, and, and support that. So I, to the Ukraine's credit, they're not, uh, you know, so well, to company's credit, they're, they're not kind of, quote, ambulance chasing. And to Ukraine's credit, they're not just saying, we, we need tech, right? Like they are very, very like mission and problem focused. Uh, and I, I, I have to say, I've been really impressed with how they consider what tech they adapt. And it's not just kind of a free for all. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's being, being government. One of the, the tenants that I operate from is to be, um, be a caretaker and a guardian as far as government resources are mm -hmm. concerned. Of course. So is, 
tail wagging the dog kind of question. So I, I just I pose that as far as what the perspective is, especially, and it was really directed to you, Doctor, as far as looking at the narrative and how that's being shaped and by whom and for what end, because they're, quite frankly, with the billions and billions and billions that are on the table and going out the door with no checks right. and no, yep. no follow-up on it. We could have a uh, expanded conversation on that, but uh, you know, I, I see some other folks lined up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Koneam, I think uh, you've talked about effectiveness. Uh, there were a couple of things in Bosnia, people in the field actually started saying the last thing they need is another visit from the Good Idea Ferry. Uh, and in World War II, when we armed merchant ships and convoys, a famous study said, they're not shooting down any planes, it's worthless. But when they started looking at, are the ships protected? They actually were, they lost fewer convoy ships, so they were looking at the right things. Do we have effectiveness studies going on? for this work effort, war effort, and what sort of proof should a company be looking at or bringing for effectiveness? Of course. Um, I imagine that there are studies going on. They're probably more on the classified space right now. There's also a dimension that it's who do you trust? because there is no such thing as a, not, as, as a party without some sort of an imperative or an incentive right now on the ground, including the Ukrainians that have the right imperative and the correct and just incentives, right? But at the same time, uh, we have ability to track certain things because we have incredible visibility into the battlefield, and I think there will be space for independent studies to be conducted, probably first on the classified space and then later on. Uh, how do companies reach effectiveness and how they can articulate effectiveness in a way that is appealing to the Ukrainians? I think the relationship that we talked about earlier uh, directly with the war fighters, the Ukrainians are... Yeah. These are people with really high level of domest domestic talent. There are a lot of IT experts there, a lot of software engineers. It's an it's a educated society, and it, they know best the nature of the threat on the ground and the type of skills and tech that they need. So I think listening to them and working with them as closely as possible is how you reach effectiveness. Yeah, what I what I have seen is it, it, it the U Ukrainians approach this much like you would within DOD in, in wanting to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars, and and that is, you know, and that I talked about the uh, kind of prototype uh, projects uh, earlier. Ukraine's still doing those. They're not simply just kind of taking tech and throwing it over the fence and seeing if it works. And if it doesn't work, you know, they either quit or they just kind of keep shoving more of it. You know, they, they're going through the same due diligence as well. Um, you know, are they doing it in an accelerated fashion? Yeah, probably. But th there's that doesn't mean it, they completely lack discipline. And and that's that's something that I think is important for the broader audience to understand. Is when you look at like OTAs and you look at uh, you know the speed at which those happen and prototype projects, uh, it does not, speed does not mean sloppy, right? And, uh, you know, my, my special warfare uh, friend Chuck here knows, you know, the SEAL teams are arguably, you know, uh, the most effective lightweight fighting force the world has ever seen. I don't think anybody would ever call them undisciplined. I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, but but the, my point is that that you don't have, you don't sacrifice discipline, you know, uh, and, and doing the right, passing the right wickets to feel the technology just because you need to do something fast. If anything, you lock down more discipline in doing that. You know, I'd like to tell you a story from the field and it's something we learned very quickly about building trust with the, with the soldiers and the Ukrainian people. On that first trip we went to Ukraine, we're in Kyiv and a senior, the, probably the most senior member of the intelligence directorate came down. We literally had five minutes with him. We flew the drone, he looked at it, one of his gentlemen and said, go ahead, and they tried to knock it out with some of their EW systems. That's all he needed, he said, all right, good, go ahead. And we know it is only gonna take one mistake and we are gonna lose the trust and confidence because again, we need to resource them, train them, and build their confidence. And we know that because 
being on the buy side when I would have vendors come to me and try to sell me snake oil of this great product that do whatever they could, they weren't allowed back in the command. We sort of laughed them out of the place, said, that's great, come back when you actually have a real technology. And by the way, we were, we're very comfortable sitting across the pond from our conflict. The Ukrainian people, it's in their back door. Imagine a, a conflict happening where we're losing our borders in Texas and they're on their way to San Diego. There, there's no time to like, give me more, give me more. Like, the, the, their country's sovereignty is on the line. All right, uh, we have six minutes, three people. This is called the speed dating lightning round. So two minutes per. Sir. Ari Lewis, uh, I'm a Navy Intel captain as well as uh, Gotta bring, director. At I need you to bring the mic up. Here we go. Uh, Ari Lewis, uh, I work for Oracle as technical director. I'm also an Intel officer, uh, cap, Navy captain. Uh, my question to you is, uh, Roger, on, on the rapid fielding, right? But the, the problem I'm running into from an industry perspective is, how do you get over the ATO, per, per, per se, right? How do you do this without increasing the, secure, the threat surface when you introduce technology? I'm sorry, say, say the last part again without? Without increasing the threat surface from a cyber perspective. Right, right. You know, I, I actually could answer that. I'm not gonna, because I actually want to hear, uh, I want to hear Chuck or Keel, I would like to hear your, your point of view on that. Super short answer, continuous ATO. It, it has, I mean, like the AT thing, ATO process is from the 90s when we used to ship software. That just needs to change. And I think fortunately there's things like the PPB Reform Commission that I think is working towards that. I think there's some interim, interim solutions where you could have a vendor be the ATO provider um, and, then, and then work through them. That's just a, that's a band-aid though to the problem that we need to fix a legacy shipping software by box and mail which ATO it was designed for. Yeah, it, it, great question, because we literally were talking about this this morning over coffee about that specific thing. ATOs are challenging for us. It puts the warfighter behind six to nine months plus, and we're a drone. We're not a complex uh, endpoint detection or management system or major critical infrastructure. I think what as industry we need to do is communicate early and often with the government and let them know what we're doing and share what we're doing so we can prepare them the second part of it is, okay, what level of ADO, ATO do you truly have to do? If you write in a contract shall, that's a lot different than saying a target and a threshold. If I can develop something based off a threshold and I can go, uh, I can go from alpha, beta to GA or TRL eight to nine like this because I'm on the lower end of the spectrum for what the threshold is, that's important too on the contracting side for the government. Thank you. Quick question, and then I'll, what protections should the private sector, both legally and physically, expect? We have a history of protecting the private sector, but as we're operationalizing systems, other countries work with the private sector, almost embolden the, the private sector, like China, Russia, the syndic crime syndicate, but here we have a clear separation between the private sector and the government. But this technology is operationalized and made dual use. We had the recent how Starlink was used initially and now pulled away. They don't want to have anything to do with this because it makes them a legitimate military target now, but that can extend all the way back to the source. So what, how do we see some of these laws or some of our policies changing to protect the unintended non-combatant in this situation? I can tell you, the, one aspect of it is part of being and working with the US government, we do have a significant amount of compliance with regards to cyber handling certain data. So the way that our infrastructure is set up, we are set up in case we know we're a target, but I mean, Microsoft Windows is being used. I mean, that could be used as a targeting tool. So Microsoft could be targeted. I mean, there's so many different ways you can look at it making sure that having tight compliance, working with the government, embracing the different systems by which the government, I mean, sometimes it's painful, what we have to do to stay compliant, but it is okay, and that actually protects us, and it's something we talk about quite deeply internally, having a federal subsidiary, making sure your people are protected, training them. We're, we have a very intensive internal training program around uh, dealing with those types of FI threats, or even internal threats. 
developing those programs, they're not that hard to do if you bring in the right people and you, in, the other thing is industry, you have to embrace the yeah. help the government wants to give you. We work with DIU on some of the, uh, the CI threat. We work with other groups within the US government to help us with that, but we embrace it. We don't push them off it's like, no, we're not going to do that. If you want to be in the game, there's a price to it and there's rules to be in the game. So embrace it and don't fight it. All right, we got two minutes. Thank you for waiting. Great, thank you. My question is actually a segue on that one. So Mark Maglin, ECS. Uh, read in the open source press that uh, a lot of the Ukrainian companies actually migrated their apps uh, to Amazon uh, East uh, because they knew the Russians, not because it was more secure, but because the Russians wouldn't be attacking the US uh, uh, physically, you know, US AWS environment. Um, what lessons learned ha do we have from uh, those uh, the cyber attacks that are going on in the commercial space um, and our dependence, uh, especially on the on cloud services. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if there's anybody from Amazon here. They might dispute, might dispute. They moved for a reason that it's less secure. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, you know, I uh, was uh, at the um, attended the uh, the AWS conference uh, not too long ago, and uh, Mikhail Fedorov, who's the minister of digital transformation, was there, and we talked. And he since publicly said this is you know th they put. Because you have to understand, a lot of what Ukraine uh, had was going from, in some cases, paper. But uh, in, in cases where they had systems, they had planned to migrate those to the cloud anyway, because government really shouldn't be in the business of probably managing their own uh, cloud services in most cases. Um, but he said, you know, the Russians can't bomb the cloud, and uh, and, and I think you do want the private sector. At companies like Amazon or Google or Microsoft, uh, you do want those companies to take on more of these workloads in their cloud environment because I, you know, they, their stock price, the you know the uh, the heads of their executives rests on their ability to provide uh, these cloud services in a very very secure way. I mean, the the minute that one of those is compromised. You know, I I think that that company is going to like never probably work in the government again in cloud services, and so I actually think it's a good thing that you see uh, Ukraine doing something like this because it's something that, quite frankly, U.S. governments uh, at all levels have been doing for for years now. So, uh, and again, the question's about actually attacking the cloud surface, you know, in, during a hot war. Uh, and our reliance on that and lessons learned. Like physical attack or like you're talking? No, cyber attack. Cyber attack. You know, you, I mean, or, or you just right? you just start drop a bomb on that data center and rest it. <laughs> you know, they know where it is. Yeah, but then you uh, have I know there's resilience. Yeah, no. I don't want to get into the, you know, the whole cloud resiliency piece, but I'm just, my, my basic question was lessons learned from the cyber attacks that were going on in the commercial space, similar to what the previous uh, uh, gentleman had asked as far as their exposure. And, and again, they, they moved their apps for a reason. Yeah. All right, we got 30 seconds, Real quick, then we're gonna wrap it. Um, a few from lessons learned in the cyberspace is that cyber warfare has not materialized. We have not seen cyber 9-11 or cyber apocalypse. Another lesson is that defense has been quite effective. And another quick lesson is that Telling the story of your success is worth revealing some intelligence that you've been uh, cultured to think is not shareable. So that's, that's been quite effective as well. All right, I think we are at time. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. I think uh, most of us will probably stick around afterwards. So if you wanted to come up, introduce yourselves, uh, have a further chat, we will make ourselves available. Thank you very much. On behalf of the U.S. Naval Institute and FCA International, we thank our speakers on the panel for taking the time to join us today and share their thoughts and insights. We'd like to present you with the token of our appreciation with the Naval Institute book, War Transformed, by Mick Ryan. Before you head back to the keynote hall, please take a moment to complete the session survey in the West App. Thank you.